Adera Park, but if it doesn't show up, fine. Mm -hmm. It should be. I just want to make sure I have enough light. <clears throat> Just because I am. That's all the light I got. Good morning, Brother Dwight. We started <clears throat> just a few minutes earlier this morning because we are working with the new computer and we just wanted to make sure that everything was in order. Um, Lighting may not be quite as good because we're uh, traveling this weekend. We're on a hotel room and it's the best we can do. Uh, so if you don't see me, at least uh, if you'll give ear, I think uh, we'll still be blessed. I do uh, want to take a moment before we get started. I want to say a thank you uh, very much to... Uh, Brother Christopher and Sister Dorothy uh, Blair, uh, who I got response from on yesterday uh, through uh, their son that they have been following me, and they're down in Gainesville, Florida. And we just want to thank them very much uh, for, uh, you know, taking time out and giving an ear to us. We know they don't have to, um, but... Uh, she said that she's enjoying the study, and we just praise God for it. Mother Felix, we say good morning to you. Sister Crystal. We have just a few more minutes, and then we'll get started. And, of course, as you look this morning, I am by myself. Pastor is uh, back at home, and he's uh, going to be doing the same thing with uh, those who can safely uh, attend uh, church and doing the social distance. And we uh, typically are together. And, uh, but uh, this morning, because of where we are, uh, he's going to do it there and we'll do it here. Uh, we say uh, good morning to uh, my sister Stacy. If you'll just bear with us two more minutes, we will get started, and then we won't hold you long, but we do want to just place a word in your heart today that we might be able to live. You know, the Word of God says, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we know how uh, critical it is for us to feed our natural bodies uh, with the bread of life, those natural foods that God has made available for us. But it's even more important to feed our spiritual lives with the bread of life, and that comes from God. That's God's word. Uh, when Satan came along to tempt him, uh, he simply responded each time, it is written. And he said, man does not live by bread alone. So what he was telling us is what we really truly live by is the word of God. So it's important for us uh, to continue to study God's word, uh, continue uh, to look to him that um, he 
might uh, continue to bless us. Because listen, after this natural life, there's another life that we have to live. But it is critical that we prepare for that life now while we have this life. And uh, the only way we can do that is uh, with the knowledge of God. So uh, it's 930. Um, we uh, will still uh, welcome those who uh, will continue to sign on, but we want to go ahead and get started. So as we uh, will bow our heads in a word of prayer, and then we'll go into our Sunday school lesson. Gracious Father, we come this morning in that wonderful, that precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. We come with thanksgiving, with praise for your many blessings. We just want to thank you because we realize that we have done nothing to have earned this, but it's out of the grace and mercy of God that you've extended our lives. You've given us a presence of mind. And Lord God, it is because of your Holy Spirit that we can even do this. We don't have the strength of ourselves. But Lord, we give your name the glory and honor that you so richly deserve. Bless your servant now. <clears throat> even as we open our mouths, you speak to things that your uh, people need to hear. Use my lips. Lord, as I humbly submit my heart unto you, bless the ears of those that will hear, the hearts that they might be drawn closer to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are continuing to study uh, from the lesson, God is faithful. God is faithful. So we've had uh, uh, a few wonderful aspects of God is faithful. We uh, looked at the lesson, uh, God will supply. And it is uh, when we are in need. God will supply the things that we need. And the word of God says he knows what we need. And we don't even have to ask him. Uh, we can thank God uh, that he will supply our every need according to his riches in glory. And then we had the aspect, God hears Elijah's prayer. Well, this is a great prophet who uh, continued to pray to God about the things that he desired God to do. And we have to know that God hears us when we pray to him. God is a prayer, excuse me, answering God. That's who he is. And when we come to him in belief, come to him in trust, come to him in honor, God will honor our prayers when we make him first in our lives. Then we studied from the aspect, the Lord, he is God. Well, you know, a lot of times uh, when we find ourselves in a situation, people go to uh, many different uh, sources for help uh, when the first place we should come to is God. Because, you know, we know that God, by his word, created all things. God is all-knowing, God is all-powerful, and God is all-present. So then if we know this about him, the first thing we should do is humble ourselves and come to him and make our prayer, our petition, our request known to God. And then we need to be patient enough to wait on God and let God do what God does best. Because remember, he is God. And then we studied uh, God sees all. So God, uh, the word of God says, God is omniscient. That means that God knows everything, everything. Nothing pass, passes God's knowledge. Even the minute things that we don't even think about, God knows about. You know, the word of God says, God knows your thoughts even before you have them. He said, he knows the words that are formed in your mouth even before you speak them. So, I mean, God knows even before you begin to speak the things that comes to you, he already knew about it. So that's the God that we serve. Then we uh, studied last week from the aspect uh, of focus on following. That means we need to know who God is and we need to know what God's word says. And then we need to be willing to follow the word of God. We can't be uh, as James says, as the waves of the sea. 
You know, when things are not going well for us, we know how to call on the Lord. And then when things uh, begin to ease off, then we then go back to doing the same things we did before. You know, James, the book of James, the word of God talks about a christen, and it really talks about our mouths. It says we take our mouths and we bless God, and then we turn around and take our mouths and curse our brothers. And the word of God says blessings and curses shouldn't come from the same place. You have to be careful what you do. You have to be careful what you say. If you say that you're a Christian, then you should act like one. Not only when it's convenient to you, but always, because you never know who's watching you. You never know whose life you're going to impress. So then you need to be careful. So today we're looking at a lesson that is entitled Miraculous Multiplication. Miraculous Multiplication. So we want to read our scriptural text uh, for you, and then we will begin our study. So we're looking in the book of Second Kings. Second Kings. What we have as a focused thought today for our lesson, our focus thought is God can take what we have and miraculously multiply it to bless us, bless us. And there are many examples in the Bible where God took a little and he made much out of it. And the much that he made was the blessing that those characters in the Bible need. But we don't only uh, know this from the characters in the Bible. We know this from our own lives. You know, God has done miraculous things in our lives. I take no credit for what God has done in my life. I simply give him praise for it. Because I often say, and maybe people don't like it, but I'm honest. I'm not smart enough. I'm not wise enough uh, to have achieved the things in life that I have if it had not been for the help of the Lord. So I give him the honor that he he deserves for the things that he has done in my life. And then our focus verse comes from 2 Kings, the fourth chapter and the seventh verse. And these are the words recorded. It says, then she came uh, and told the man of God. And he said, go sell, sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. Well, this is the verse that we will be focusing on throughout study today. Uh, and there are a few things, certainly, that we want to draw from it. So our lesson text, Second uh, Kings 4, and this is going to be verses 1 through 7. Now there, there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons, of the prophet up unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditors is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And, excuse me, and she said, thine handmaid had not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So when she uh, went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her son, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her sons, Bring me yet a, a vessel. And she said, and he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil, pay thy debt, and live thou and 
thy children of the rest. <clears throat> the outline, we haven't always had an outline of study. And today our outline is, it talks about the widow uh, was left with insurmountable death, debt. Creditors were coming, the threat of losing her sons. At times we will face difficult challenges. The widow cried out to Elisha, what do you have in your house? God will always start with what we have in, in the house. Borrow vessels. They filled all the vessels. The widow paid her debt. God will multiply what we have in the house. God can use whatever we have. What, what you have is enough. Trust God to multiply and to bless. So, multiply, uh, miraculous multiplication. We have been studying, uh, you know, that God is faithful. And again, we will see God in this lesson being faithful to a woman who trusts him. There are a few uh, scriptures that I wanted to share with you uh, as we get started. And these are scriptures that we use often in our teachings during the course of the week because they're relevant to uh, us and continuing uh, with our walk with God. If you go, uh, again, I always say, if you don't have your Bibles with you, if you have a paper and pen, if you'll just write these down, you can always go look at them at a later time. But if you'll go with us uh, to the book of Hebrews, and we want to look at uh, first uh, the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews and verse six, because this is relevant to this lady's walk. Now, uh, and we'll read these two verses and then uh, hopefully you'll begin to come into understanding what we should extract from our lesson today. So 11 and six says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. That's the him is God. And it says, for he that cometh to God, right, must first believe that he is a rewarder of them, excuse me, that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So that scripture is simply telling us, you don't go to a bank that's broke. If you go to a bank because you need money, you go to a bank or a financial institution that you feel can help you in the crisis that you find yourself in when you are short of the financial that you need in order to uh, come out of whatever that debt is. You know, it's senseless to go to a bank that's already broke because you know they can't help you. So what the scripture is saying, don't come to God if you don't believe that God can help you in the situation you're in. You first got to believe that he has. Remember, he is the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God, the all-present God. So he knows everything, he sees everything, and he is everywhere. So we come to him because we feel like he has the power to do whatever we need done. We trust him. So then we make our prayers or our requests our petitions known to him. But again, don't come if you don't believe. And don't only use God when you find yourself in a crisis or in challenging situations. And then when God helps you, you forget all about it. Or you think that you've done something on your own. I don't care what ability you have. You simply got to recognize it comes from God. You know what? If you have the power to wake up this morning, and that you could wake up when you wanted to, but you don't. God gives you that strength. God gives you that power. He said, well, my clock woke me up. Well, there are a lot of people still lying in the bed and their clocks are going off, but they don't hear them anymore because the breath of life has left them. That's the power of God. We can't take credit for that. We have to give him the credit. The other verse I want you to look at, because again, with our lesson, we'll begin to see it unfold. It is in Hebrews 10 and 7. And this is what it says. Then said I, 
Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now, this is Jesus Christ declaring that the whole Bible, whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is written of him. And every uh, 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 occasion in the Bible, God is referenced. Jesus Christ is referenced in whatever uh, the, the story is being told. And we have to extract that for ourselves. Now, so our lesson talks about the miraculous multiplication and it talks about this woman. And in, in the Bible time, it was certainly uh, understandable when uh, there was a, a, a servant of God or a man of God. And, you know, he had to care for his family. Uh, he would make these provisions sometimes by uh, borrowing from those that were who who were a bit more fortunate than he was, and then he would either pay his debt off by working for this person or by working uh, with what this person had provided for him, and then the money that he made, he would then uh, pay back uh, the vows or the debts that he had. Well, this story begins. The woman comes to the prophet Elisha. Well, in this story, Elisha is the god of the time. All right, remember, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It talks about Elisha, but Elisha is the representation of God at this time. And it says that this woman declares unto Elisha. You know, it, it, it's like she is uh, declaring her right to come to the prophet and declare what her issues are. The uh, creditors who her uh, husband had borrowed from uh, is now coming to seek payment of what he had borrowed. But he's, he's dead now. He's gone on. And he is no longer able to pay the debt. Well, the law at the time was someone had to pay the debt off. So then the, uh, the, the, the provider of, of the service of her husband uh, had the right to then take her two sons and put them under bond, meaning that now they belong to him until they were able to work off the debt that was incurred by their father that he had not paid before his death. Well, this woman comes to Elijah. He's the prophet of the time. And she comes to Elijah and Elisha, thank you, comes to Elisha and uh, 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 she says to him that she is, or the Bible tells us that she is the wife of one of the prophets uh, of the time, meaning that she is in the close uh, realm of uh, the men of God and she feels like she has a right uh, to come to God directly and make her petitions known. Now, Elisha asked her, you know, what what do you want me to do? This is later in, 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 in the uh, book of uh, uh, the four, uh, fourth chapter of Kings, second Kings. And, you know, he's having a conversation. But this woman makes it known. Listen, I am among my own people. You know, when he says, do you want me to go to the king for you? Do you want me to go to one of the captains? Because everybody didn't have the right. And I mean, we can all come to Jesus, but the, when we truly have a right to come to him is when we're obedient to his word, when we have received the salvation that Christ has provided for us, it says once we receive the spirit of God, we become, right, the children of God. And as children, we have a direct right to come to our father and ask him for whatever we desire as long as it's within his will. Well, again, this is what this woman is doing. She feels like she has the right because she's a wife of the prophet. Even though he's died and gone on, there is uh, the order of, of the prophets. There is a need for them to continue uh, to be her support line uh, so that she might gain what she needs. And all she has left now is her two sons. Well, if they take her two sons and put them in bond, how is she going to live? 
So she makes her request known uh, to Elisha. And so then in the outline, it says the widow was left with an insurmountable debt. debt. She had a debt that she couldn't pay. Well, I want you to understand what this really means. This woman had a physical debt because of the borrowing of her husband and the situation he left her in. We're born in life, in this natural life. We are born with an insurmountable debt. We are born in the sin. And that's what the Bible says. And we cannot forgive our sins. That's why we do the things we do. That's why we say the things we say. It's nothing that we've done. This woman didn't do anything of herself. Her husband left her in that situation, just like Adam and Eve left us in this situation. When we come into this world, we come in with an insurmountable debt that we can't pay, but we owe it. And if we don't pay it, or if somebody doesn't pay it for us, then we will also die with this debt. But we can come to that great prophet, Jesus Christ, and he is able to pay the debt that we can't pay. You know, that's where you hear the adage, you know, uh, God came and, 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 you know, he paid the debt that he did not owe because we owed a debt that we could not pay. So when we come to him and we yield our lives to him, then he will pay that debt for us and we can enjoy the freedom that he uh, delivers us from the sin that we were born into. So we need to understand this. It only represents the insurmountable debt of the woman who her husband left her with. And listen, the creditors are coming. Now, our creditor, you know, when we are continuing to live in sin, uh, our creditor is Satan. And it is his intent to collect everything we have until we physically die away from this earth. In John 10, 10, the book of uh, John, he writes, for the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's his intent, to take away the life that God has given to us. Take it away before we come into a full recognition of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And if we die without Jesus in our lives, we can fool ourselves that we're on our way to heaven. Uh, well, and I know it, it, it is a lot easier to swallow that way. But you know what? Without truth, you won't make it. You need to accept what Christ has done in the way of salvation, and then you are on the road to going to be with him and live in eternity. Otherwise, Satan is going to continue to collect, and he will collect by any means necessary. He'll collect through your finances. He'll collect through your health, he'll collect through your children, he'll collect through your relationships, he'll collect through your, he doesn't care. He simply wants to overwhelm you with the debt of life that you won't even consider God. You'll be so confused, he'll send you to alcohol, he'll send you to drugs, he'll send you to homeowning, he'll send you to whatever it takes to get you engrossed, engrossed in whatever sins your life uh, 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 light, and then you never come to the truth of God. But when you know you can come to him, as this woman comes to the prophet, come to him boldly. Ask forgiveness, and God will forgive you. Because again, what the creditors were doing here was threatening to take away a son, just like our creditor threatens to take away whatever it is that's important in our lives. And, and li listen, I don't care how you live, and, and let, let me tell you something. You put your faith in maybe your money, you put your faith in your education, you put your faith in your achievements in life, you put your faith in a lot of things, and it says that he who comes to God must first believe that he is. Now, in, in, in 11 and 1, it says, now faith is the substance of things hopeful and the evidence of things not seen. 
So our faith, our trust has to be in God. Listen, it's not a hard life to live. And once you come to know who God is, it's actually a much easier life to live and a more beautiful life because a lot of things that stresses people out, you don't even consider because the word of God says we have a right to cast all our cares on him. He cares for us. So I'll let him take care of the things I can't do. You know, I'm going to do all that I can. And we'll see this again as our lesson unfolds. So when we come up with these challenges in our lives that are very difficult, it is a good thing to know, as this woman did, she went to the prophet. We know that we can come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we can make our petitions known to him. You know, remember when we studied about Elijah and Elijah praying to the Lord, uh, we have that aspect that God hears our cry. Well, when the widow came to Elisha, she cried out to him. He heard her cry. He wanted to know what he could do for her. Because we have to understand, God uh, knows what we need and he knows how to do it. Now, one thing it is, uh, in, in her situation, you know, when uh, Alicia asked her, when she explained the situation and now she's about to lose her son, Alicia asked her, what do you have? What do you have? in your house. And her uh, first response was because, you know, it, it's like the question was overwhelming. I came to you to tell you the situation I'm in. You turned around and asked me, what do I have? And then she says, well, I don't have anything. But as she's speaking, she remembers, but I have just a little bit of oil in a pot. Well, you have to understand in the Bible, what oil represent. It is the anointing of God. Now, you may not have a whole lot of God's anointing, but if you have enough anointing of God to know who he is, God will take that touch of anointing. And he will multiply it in your life miraculously. He begins with your mind, your heart, and then God deals with you in a way that you can't even explain. God multiplies things in our lives that, you know, we'll look back and we don't even know how we came out of them. We don't know how we dealt with them. We don't know how we overcame them. But all we have to recognize that it was by the power of God. And then we have to give God praise for what he's done. So the woman says, I have a pot of oil. And that's all I have. So now I want you to understand that God doesn't work the way man works. We won't understand when God tells us what to do. We won't understand how God tells us to do it. But what God wants from those who will follow him is obedience and trust. The Bible says this, my ways are not yours. My ways are as high is the heaven from the earth is your ways or for mine. And God also says this, I take foolishness and confound the wise. The way you think things will work out, they never work out. And you try them until you're exhausted. But when you're obedient to do what God says, you're never going to understand how this is going to work because God wants you to put your trust in him. And we see this in this widow because when you really uh, think about the story, I probably would be a little bit reluctant to do what the prophet tells me to do. And when we read the word of God, most of us think it doesn't take that to be a Christian. Most of us think, well, that's foolishness. And, you know, most of us even go to the point of calling those who are willing to live for the Lord fanatics. You know, they're crazy. Yeah, well, okay, if that makes you feel good to call me crazy, I'm all right with that. But one thing I do know, I know that my, the Lord that I serve is not crazy. And I trust that is 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 unbelievable. What he says to me to do sounds, if I do it, it's going to work to my good because that's his promise. And I believe the promises of God. 
So then uh, Eli 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 Elisha tells this woman uh, to do some things. And again, I want you to consider the things that he is telling her to do. She's in debt. She's about to lose her sons. Well, now, I don't want you to take this literally, but I want you to see God in it. See God in what God tells Elisha to tell her. Because, ironically, you wouldn't think that if you're in debt, the way to get out of debt is to borrow. That puts you, in my mind, further in debt. But then you also have to understand how God works. God doesn't uh, put the woman or make her more indebted because what he uh, instructs her to do. He simply forces her to trust and put her faith in what the prophet tells her. Now you come, you know, most of us, when we get into uh, uh, a difficult situation, this is what we do. We come to the Lord and we begin to pray. Most of us don't pray daily. Most of us don't even talk to the Lord. We get up in the morning. We don't bend our knees. We go to bed at night. We don't bend our knees. We uh, go into a situation during the course of the day. And there's never a thank you out of our mouth. God, we, we can see danger and God protects us from it. And we never say thank you. But as soon as we get in a difficult situation, everybody knows who God is. We begin, you know, I prayed, I thank the Lord. Yes, you did because you needed something. But what happens when uh, God is just, you know, everything you get comes from God. So everything deserves a thank you. That's why the Bible says, in all things, give thanks. Because this is the will of God concerning us. We don't do nothing of ourselves, so give thanks. Just like this woman, she needed something. She came to the Lord. And most of us who don't even know the Lord, we know somebody who knows the Lord. So then what we do is we go to them. Can you pray for me? You know, we're all sad and broken because of the situation we're in. And we, we feel like there's somebody that can get a prayer through. So we come to them and we ask them to pray with us. You know, but as soon as God uh, lifts the burden, then we forget. And we also forget the person who we ask to pray with us. You know, that prayer partner that we rely on. We don't even tell them thank you. And they recognize that they've not really done anything. But they've only asked God on your behalf to bless you. And that's what Elisha was doing. So God asked this woman through Elisha, tells her through Elisha, to go borrow empty vessels from all of her neighbors. Now, the word of God says, not just a few. Well, what that means when we would say it today uh, in the way we speak, borrow as many as you can. You can't get too many. When he said, not just a few, get as many as you can and get, you know, as many neighbors that will help you. And this is that prayer. You know, they're not literally praying, but they are trusting that, you know, and these are empty vessels. So you're not going to be indebted except after the vessels is emptied again, is to return them to who you borrowed them for. So God is not going to put us in a greater uh, 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 situation of distress. It's only our belief in what he's telling us to do and our obedience to it that God will bring us out. So the woman goes and uh, she does what the prophet tells her. She borrows vessels from his many neighbors. Now, we, we, you know, the story doesn't tell us why she stopped uh, with where she stopped or could she have borrowed any more. But when she stopped, it's like God knows exactly what we need. Early in the Bible, when the children of Israel was coming uh, out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness, you know, and they were hungry and they prayed to God. God heard their prayer and God began to rain manna from on heaven in this manner was simply uh, what they needed to be sustained uh, from their natural hunger, which represents the word of God. But God told them, don't gather any more than you need for today. If you gather too little, you'll still have enough. If you gather too much, it won't last. 
gather because God didn't want them to depend on what they could gather in excess of what they needed today. Only what you need today. And what they found was if they gathered anything in excess, the next day when they went by, it was full of worms. They couldn't even eat it. You have to trust that God is a daily supplier of all that we need. So then we know that whatever the uh, number that she gathered, God knew that it was enough to do what needed to be done. And that you can't, you know, if, if she gathered so many vessels that she could pay her debt off and still have, uh, uh, you know, an abundance left, then she would put her trust in the abundance of what was left instead of still trusting the God who had brought her to this point. God knows he's because he is. And again, the word omniscient or omniscience. He, you know, we, we trust scientists, but God knows everything. So we have to trust him even above the greatest minds of scientists of the world. We can trust him because whatever knowledge the scientists have, God gave it to them. They couldn't get it of themselves. So she has a, a vessel. Now, Elisha tells her, when you have done this, you go into the room, you and your sons, and you shut the door behind you. Listen, what this does is it shuts off the influence of those who doesn't have the same faith you have. You know, when you come to the Lord, you have to have a made up mind because there's too many people and close, the closer people are to you, the more detrimental they are to your life. Your family, Husband, wife, children, mother, father. These are the people, your best friends. These are the people who will try to come between you and God. These are the people who will tell you that you don't need to do this. You know, and that's why the Bible says, and it doesn't mean a literal, but the Bible says you have to hate husband, wife, children, mother, father, and you have to cleave to the Lord Jesus. You've got to love him. Above all, that's why the Bible says you've got to love the Lord, the Lord God with all your heart, all your might, all your soul. He has to be the love of your life. You know, God has blessed me with a beautiful wife. And I'm indebted to it because the Lord told me if I don't take care of her, I'm worse than an infidel. But you know what? She is clear. God is first. She's second. And that's the way it's got to be. You know, if if God tells me to do something and she has the faith that I have, then we, we have no issues. And if and if she doesn't, I have to stand where God tells me to stand. And I am assured that God will bring her around. I mean, it's equally the same with me and her. If God tells her to do something, she has to do what God tells her to do. I may not be there, but when God talks to her, now God will touch my heart, certainly, because he has made me her covering. So he will touch my heart to allow her to do that. And, you know, the thing is, God will bring us to one. And we understand this. This woman no longer has a husband. God knows that you need to shut out all outside influence. You can't be influenced by those who don't trust God like you did. You have to know God for yourself. You have to have your own testimony. Because you spend enough time with God to know his ability in your life. Elisha says, go in, shut the door behind you. This is now going to be between God, you, and your sons. So then the woman goes, they go in, shut the door, and the mother of the two sons now instructs them, bring me an empty vessel. Now remember what she said. She has only a pot with a little oil in it. But the God that we serve does things in a mighty way. You know, I'm always reminded of creation. It's nothing but the word of God. Everything you see starts from God's word. Because the Bible says, and God said, let there be. And it was. So whenever God speaks, it's going to be. So she's in the room and it says she uh, now tilts the pot of oil and she begins 
and the first vessel is full. Now, this has got to be miraculous. It says miraculous multiplication. Well, the miraculous is the divine. God increased in his divine power. He can magnify things, multiply things that man can't do. I mean, and we see this uh, thread throughout the Bible. If we come to the New Testament, remember uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000 men and women and children above that with two fish and five loaves of bread. God is a miraculous working God. So this isn't uh, something new. Uh, remember, Elisha is a follower of Elijah. Elijah parted the Jordan, walked across on dry land. Elijah uh, uh, ra uh, was, was uh, sustained uh, by a raven and by the widow who only had a little bit of meal and uh, a very little oil in the cruise. So, I mean, this is just a thread of God going on. And what God is saying is just like he was with them, he'll be with us if we trust him. This woman trusts what the prophet says. God is with her through her obedience of what she's doing. She begins to fill her vessels. And the word of God says, and she fills vessel after vessel. Her pot never runs empty, never. But everything she has borrowed, the Bible declares, she fills it. And then she cries out to her son, bring me yet another vessel. And her son says, mom, there are no more empty vessels. Now you have to tell me, how in the world do you start with one pot that's not even full and you fill all the empty vessels that you've borrowed. You can't accept it's the power of God. And it says, as soon as the last vessel was full, as soon as it was full, says the oil stayed, or in the way that we would speak today, it ran dry. There was no more need for oil because there were no more vessels to fill. And now watch what the widow does. What normally we wouldn't do. She was obedient to the prophet. She comes back now. Because remember. Lo, I'm, I come in the volume of the book. Elisha is the God. That she's speaking to. Because he's representing God. So she comes back. And she says. To him. Thank you. Because what you told me to do. Is done. And God has shown up in his divine way that only God could do it. You know, this is the same God that consumed the offering on the altar, you know, that uh, Elijah built when he said, if they'll be God, serve him. But if God be God, we're going to serve him. And this is the same God that now has worked, wrought this great work in this woman's life. So she comes back to say thank you. Well, Elisha is not going to take any credit for what God's done. You came to me because you were in a challenging situation. I told you what God told me to tell you. That's all I can do. I'm not going to take credit for it. You don't have to do it. That's on you. This woman didn't have to do anything. She could have thought what Elisha told her to do was just crazy. Did not make sense. But in her obedience, she did it. And God worked through her obedience with the little bit that she had. And God blessed her bountifully so that she would be able to accomplish what she needed to do. When she told the prophet, the prophet simply said this, go, sell what you have, pay off your debt. That was your request. And then he said, and the rest of it, you and your family live on. So not only did God free her from her debt or free us from our sin, right? But God uh, sent, sending his Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, he sends that. God doesn't just release us from our ignorance. God just doesn't bring us out of darkness into light. He also fills us with his Spirit that we have enough to live off even after he has freed us. And that's what is represented in this story with the woman. 
She pays off her debt. Now her sons are free. We are free from the sin that had us captive. But not only are we free, we live in freedom because God gave us enough of his spirit. And, you know, that uh, showering anointing, which that all represents, is what we walk in daily. You know, this is the same oil that uh, David says, you know, poured on his head and his cup ran over. And, and, and this is the same anointing oil that God anointed all the kings with. This is the same anointing oil. You know, a lot of people, uh, we, were, we were in uh, service one Sunday. And, you know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. After service, we had a, an altar call where we pray with people who have a special prayer request. And we anoint them with oil. And uh, I had some visiting friends that came along who they don't do it at their church. And uh, so, uh, and, and, and listen, we were in Bible study together, uh, him along with some other brothers, and we were studying every Tuesday before, you know, uh, the uh, COVID-19 hit. Now, these are brothers who we study together. But he asked, he said, what is that y'all did? at the end of service where everybody came up and y'all did that thing on their head. Well, I mean, people don't understand the significance of the oil that the woman had. It is what God uses to anoint the minds and hearts of those. Right? It certainly, it is symbolic of the spirit of God. The power is not in the oil. The, pow the power is in the obedience of anointing with the oil. And when we do what God says, God honors what we've done because we honor him by doing so. So now she pays the debt. Her sons are free. And Elisha says to her, now you can live off of the rest of it. This is only God being represented in the story in every, every minute detail. And the work that uh, God has done for those of us who love him and believe him that what he has done is what we need. But again, it is in our obedience to doing what we say. You know, uh, the Bible says that we have to, have to repent of our sins. You know, I said, I think on Friday in our lesson, you know, and I'm, I'm still waiting for somebody uh, to uh, uh, respond with, that prayer in the Bible that says all you got to do is um, pray that prayer, you know, Lord, I, I, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he died for me, you know, and now uh, you're saved. Find that in the Bible, you know, because uh, then um, we can help a lot of people because that's what people are willing to do. Uh, I, I don't see it. And, you know, I'm not I'm not going to say. I'm the greatest Bible scholar there is because I'm far from that. But I mean, you know, I have read Bible cover to cover more than once, and I don't see it in the Bible. Um, so I don't, I, I don't teach it, I don't preach it. You know what I'm saying? I preach what the Word of God says, and, and and what Jesus told Nicodemus is that you must be born again, born of water. That means baptism, and of spirit. That means the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Remember, John the Baptist has already come and said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So then if we put things in order, you have to repent because John came as a forerunner. And then you be baptized in water and you be baptized with the Spirit of God. That's the obedience God is calling you to. Then you go in your room and shut the door. Don't be listening to everybody who tells you something different than what Jesus has already declared. You know what? Because there will always be distractions in the world. There will always be something to draw us back away from God. You know, the things that we take for granted, the things that, you know, we want to do in our flesh that makes us feel that we uh, are, are, you know, are adults, you know, we can do what we want. You know, uh, my wife and I was talking and, you know, 
we, we simply were talking about children and how all of us as, as children have made that comment, I'll be glad when I'm old enough, enough to get out of my parents' house. Well, that's simply because we're disobedient and because we don't want to do what our parents has instructed us to do. But the greatest lesson is when we leave, we realize, Lord, we had a great in our parents' house. And that's how it is when we're in God. When we're in Jesus Christ, we have a great. But when those distractions come, because I don't want to do what the Lord says, and we, he's not going to force us. So we can go back and do the things that we've done before. There's a, a story that's told in reverse. And uh, it's, it talks about the prodigal son. And there were these two sons, one who thought that he had reached an age that he should be able to do what he wanted. And he asked his father for the things that he thought belonged to him because he wanted to leave home. Well, the Bible says he left home and he lived a riotous life or he lived a life that was totally against what his father taught him, totally against what God desired of him. And he lost everything. He found himself eating out of a pig's pen. But then he came to himself, and that meant he repent, repented. And he says, my father have servants who eat better than I. He says, I will go to my father and repent and ask my father not to restore me to where I was because I'm not deserving. But if he would just make me one of his servants, I would be blessed. But because Jesus Christ loves us, he wants to put us back where we were. And when his father saw him coming, his father ran to him. And that's why the Bible says Jesus stands all the time with his arms wide open, stands at the door of our hearts knocking. You know, when you hear the word of God and you're being drawn by what you, what you hear, that's the Lord Jesus knocking at your heart. But then James also makes it plain. It happens as long as you're hearing the word. But then after you turn the preacher off, after you leave church, after the teaching is no longer going, going on, James says, you were like a man that was in the mirror. You remember your image when you were standing in front of the mirror. But when you leave the mirror, you begin to forget. Well, that's what he's saying. You, you forget what you were hearing when the, the, the man of God or, or was teaching or preaching. And then you, you just... It doesn't have that same effect on you. Well, this young man came back to his father. His father uh, restored him to the place that he was. That's what God will do. But your best walk is to remain in God because we can fall so deep that it's almost impossible to get back to the Lord. Don't allow that to happen. Don't find yourself in an insurmountable debt that you can't pay. You know what I'm saying? Call on the Lord. The Bible also says that there's some things, you know, God gives us plenty of opportunity, but there's a time that God says, I will uh, uh, give you over to a reprobated mind. And that's a mind where you're not even going to hear what God is saying to you. And then you're, you're, you're lost. It's over for you. Don't ever allow God to turn you over to that kind of mind because there's nothing too bad for you to do. You'll do anything and think that it's okay. And that's a bad place to be. Know that God loves you. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to free us and to release us from the debt. And what we owe, we owe to him. We should come to him as the widow came to Elisha and praise him for the work that was done in her life and the freedom that her sons gained and not having to stay under the bondage that wasn't even created by them, just like the bondage of sin that's not created by us. But listen, we can't even find comfort in being able to say, well, I didn't do anything wrong. It was my father, Adam. When you learn that, I said, I always say my father told me, that you can learn by what people do as well as by what they don't do. 
Okay, so you know that Adam fell. All right? So we learn from that. But now what do you learn? By not doing the same thing. Because you know it was wrong. You know where it, Adam and Eve ended up for the things that they did. They were put out of the garden. Adam was cursed. Even the very ground that God had made was cursed. So then that meant until he repented, he lived under a curse. Well, we're born under that curse. And if we don't repent, we live our lives throughout eternity under that curse. And that's not God's intent. When he created Adam, he created him in perfection. And the only way we can get to perfection is in Jesus Christ. We will never in these bodies, in these uh, earthen vessels, reach perfection. But in Christ Jesus, we are made perfect through the work of salvation that he has done for us. Miraculous multiplica uh, multiplication. That's what God does in our lives when, you know, because it tells us that the love that Christ has, you understand, know that he gave to us, says it covers, it multiplies itself so greatly that it covers all of the sins that we have been a part of. And, and listen, even after receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, I'm here to tell you, it doesn't mean that we won't miss God. But again, we can come back to him. It says, come boldly. Ask God forgiveness. We don't want to continue to do the same thing. In Romans 6, it asks the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, we don't want to exhaust the grace of God. When we know that we're out of the will of God, we ask God's forgiveness and we pray that God gives us the strength that we don't have to contend in it. In, in the sixth chapter of Romans, Paul the greatest uh, 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 disciple of God says that as long as we're in these bodies, we're going to have a challenge of our flesh. And that's why we have to fight to bring our flesh under subjection that we might be able to live for the Lord. Because let me tell you, your flesh wants to do what your flesh wants to do. And that's not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Listen, uh, we love you and we certainly hope that you have been blessed. Uh, by uh, the word of God today, miraculous multiplication, if you will just give God the opportunity. Jesus Christ will multiply what you have, that little bit of faith that you can muster in him, right? He will multiply it to the point where you can come, come boldly to him, ask him to forgive you. If you but you first got to forget about who you are or who you think you are, come to him and allow him to do the work in your life that needs to be done as he did to this woman and her two sons. Listen, we love you, we bless you, and we hope that you will continue just to hear the word of God and be blessed. So we say amen, and uh, we look to see you again. We bless you.